the Euphorbiaceae, or Spurge family. That's Spurge, not Splurge. These are dicots that are mostly tropical, although you can find them around the world. Um, they have a distinctive uh, feature is they have a milky latex uh, sap if you pull off a leaf or make a hole in them one way or another. Uh, generally white goo will come out. They're mostly herbs, although you find a few trees or shrubs. And some of them look remarkably like uh, cactuses. They have opposite leaves with stipules, and if the leaves are uh, compound, they're palmate. They have strange little flowers. Um, they um, have a structure called a cyanthium that can only be called a strange little flower. Uh, the fruits are usually a schizocarp. Uh, there are some economically important members of this family. Cassava is an extremely important uh, carbohydrate source for a large part of the world. Uh, castor oil, uh, Barbados nut, uh, rubber tree, and uh, poinsettia. Characteristics, um, well, there's the funny little flowers. Um, these, uh, this little thing here is the, the female bit, the sigma style ovary. So you can see it here and you can see it there. And uh, the anthers are placed in uh, arrangements um, around that um, cyanthium. Uh, the key characteristics are the cyanthium, uh, the milky sticky juice also is um, uh, pretty unique to Euphorbiaceae. There are other plant, other species, uh, other families that do have milky sap uh, sometimes. We're in the Malpighiales, and I uh, have about 300 genera, 750, 7,500 fam uh, species. There are, um, this is one family that has uh, got a lot of uh, issues taxonomically. We're up in the upper right in the rosid group on our evolutionary tree, Malpighiales. Um, we have, um, as I already mentioned, cassava, Maniha esculenta, is a very important. Um, carbohydrate source. The ladies at the right are uh, pounding this cassava into a powder. And um, there's also uh, castor bean, the castor oil plant is important. Uh, Barbados nut is uh, eaten widely around the world. Rubber trees used to harvest uh, rubber and uh, made into uh, natural rubber. Poinsettia, of course, uh, makes Christmas Christmas. And then uh, on the bad side of things is uh, leafy spurge. Uh, here you have uh, poinsettia growing in a natural, or essentially a natural condition. Uh, it's actually kind of a rangy plant and uh, tends to spread by runners and get fairly tall. The uh, one that we use uh, for Christmas decorations obviously has been um, hybridized and some fancy special technique is used to uh, graft uh, branches on so that every branch branches and it doesn't get leggy. It's native to Central, and Central America and Mexico. It was named after um, somebody named Poinsett, who was uh, one of the, um, he was a politician. He was ambassador to Mexico and uh, several other places. And uh, he was so enamored with this plant that uh, when they got around to naming it, they named it, a uh, common name, they named it after him. We actually have December 12th as National Poinsettia Day because that was the day Mr. Poinsett died. Um, the um, uh, red things that you see are not actually flowers. The flowers are the funny little things, the little cyanthium in the middle, and the red guys are uh, bracts. And uh, if you recall when we talked about um, uh, what plants can see, uh, we talked about how they needed um, certain points that need a certain length of uh, darkness before they'll start um, um, turning those bracts red in the fall. Uh, they need 12 hours of uninterrupted dark in order to trigger that response. Otherwise, it's just a green plant with these tiny little flowers on it. Um, the U.S. industry for uh, poinsettias was, um, uh, had a, one family was initial for, was responsible for just the initial uh, marketing and um, sort of raising the awareness of poinsettias, and then um, they um, uh, figured out uh, this method of um, grafting so that um, you got these big bushy plants and they wouldn't tell anybody else how to do it. And so until literally the 1990s, uh, they had the market cornered. <coughs> And then uh, somebody in a university someplace figured out how to do it and published a paper. So um, they sort of lost their uh, grip on the market, but they stu do, still do apparently have um, uh, about 70% of the market. Um, it's a, an urban myth that it's highly toxic. It, uh, you know, if you ate three or four of these plants, you probably would get a stomach ache, but that would probably be the case of about any plants that you could come across. So. Uh, um, the sort of uh, scaremongers that, you know, think your poodle's going to fall over dead if it licks one, um, 
uh, need to be told that it's really not that toxic. Rubber tree, interesting plant. Um, you can see these sort of spiral um, scars on the trees. Uh, when they harvest them, you know, obviously the harvesting is quite similar to uh, maple syrup, um, except that it's not it just at a certain time of the year when the sap is running. This is actually not sap. This is uh, um, a protective um, substance that the trees grow just under their bark um, and not, not deeper into the tree at all. And uh, they have to be tapped just right, or they'll, you'll go too deep and they will damage the tree. And obviously they want the trees to keep, um, keep leaking. So um, it's not as easy as uh, you might think to get the sap out of there. The sap comes out of specialized cells called lacticifers. And um, they are indeed right under the bark because this is a defense mechanism for the, the trees and, their, and other plants that, that produce this. They're uh, trying to deter insects from feeding on them. And, in, and indeed, um, they get you know, this big, sticky, gooey, um, toxic um, sap for an insect uh, is uh, quite a deterrent. Uh, the goo has a lot of polymers of isoprene in it, and that's what it then is uh, used to make rubber. Um, especially with this process of vulcanization where they use uh, sulfur to cross-link the rubber. It makes a much harder uh, rubber than, uh, than they had had before. So they got better tires and bowling balls and all kinds of things out of it. They estimate there's still 900 million or 9 million tons uh, produced annually of natural rubber. Um, obviously, um, chemistry has come a long way, so there's um, artificial rubbers are produced uh, fairly widely also. Uh, the biggest production areas is Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia. And um, they uh, uh, have refined it to be quite a, um, uh, there's quite a technique to doing this. And so uh, the more successful you are at tapping them without killing the trees, uh, the better off you're going to be as far as um, long-term costs. Uh, cassava is eaten um, around the world, um, especially in tropical areas, extremely important um, carbohydrate source. Um, it can lead to some problems in that um, it does have um, uh, some um, cyanogenic glycosides in it, and if it is not soaked and um, uh, dried or in some way or other um, caused uh, to, for these glycosides to um, release their, si their uh, hydrogen cyanide, um, then it gets released in the person who eats it, which obviously is a negative. Um, they find that um, it's also a pretty poor protein source. So when you get uh, cultures that are very hungry um, due to you know, drought or whatever, um, if they're living pretty much on nothing but uh, cassava, they're not in um, too good a shape. But if they find some other protein to, um, to complement it, it's actually a, an excellent food source. It's widely cultiva cultivated and now, in Africa, Asia, and Indian areas where it grows in very, very, very um, poor soils where other crops would uh, fail. It is, however, native to South America. And uh, they estimate in 2008 there was 230 million metric tons were produced. It is interestingly being used as a biofuel also um, on small scale. And we'll listen to this lady. Um, she has quite a strong accent, but I think you'll um, uh, get the gist of it as she starts talking. Selin is uh, the widow who was left three years ago by her late husband. The young boy Edwin was not yet even born when the, fa the father died. And we have Akini who is going to nursery school. She's got a total of five children, uh, three boys and uh, two girls. Um, the, after the death of the, fa the husband, uh, Selin has been having a lot of problems. She's been forced to work on other people's farm in order to get food for the children. Two years ago, when the project came, Koyaro Women Group, which, which is a member, they got seed material for improved cassava and they planted as a group. So from the group farm, she was able to get a few cuttings, which she came and planted in her uh, an eighth of an acre. And from that an eighth, she's been able to get enough uh, food for the family where she can boil the cassava and also is able to sell. Some even farmer, uh, community members come to buy from her home and the rest she sells to the nearby market. Yeah, it has changed her life completely from working for people, like she, before she was working for people. And like this year, the money that she's paying is solely from the cassava plot that she's harvesting. And she's paying the school fee and also improving her lifestyle. 
uh, after the death of her husband, she was left with a grass touched house that was very much leaking. And because the house was leaking, the house even fell down. And with the little she was been able to get from the sales of cassava and other uh, activities, she was able to now even to improve. She's now putting up a, an iron sheet house that is just behind us and is going to be finished in a few months' time. Uh, from the one beneath of a farm that she got the cuttings, she's now been able to expand to a, a quarter of an acre. People are coming to buy tubers more than she can supply. So she's seeing that if she increases the acreage, that will mean more income even to her family and her children will now that necessary she'll be able to take them to secondary school and even to colleges if she will be able to get a good production of cassava. So with the cassava project she's very happy and her life is going to change a great deal. That was from a Farm Africa um, presentation. So next up we have castor oil, which comes from uh, Ricinus communis, uh, the castor bean plant, which is not a legume, so they aren't really beans, but it produces these big um, um, snazzy looking seeds that get called beans. Um, they are often planted for horticultural um, interest. It is a, um, uh, a toxic plant, so they say uh, even four uh, seeds could uh, kill some people. And so um, uh, kind of a, people worry about poinsettias, and I think it's probably better off worrying about your castor beans. Um, however, the oil is uh, quite useful, and it is used in making a wide range of things, soaps and lubricants and brake fluids and dyes, um, perfumes, um, quite a quite a few different things. Um, it is uh, an issue to harvest. Uh, some people get very sensitive to even brushing up against the plant. So um, other uh, uses, other oils are, um, prob are becoming more popular. But nevertheless, because of the purity and the partic particulars of the chemical structure of um, castor oil, there are still some um, specific uses. And uh, again, it is um, also being used for biodiesel. Now for the downside of the Spurge family, there's uh, numerous uh, Spurges uh, around the world that are quite invasive, and here in the Midwest and out west, um, we have leafy Spurge, Euphorbia estula, that uh, came over, it's a native um, Europe and Russia, it was accidentally brought in with um, uh, hay that was brought with animals uh, when uh, people were uh, first settling the United States and uh, was found 1827, was it first noted on the East Coast. Um, it probably had been there for quite a while. And um, another um, um, 80, 90 years, and it had gotten all the way to North Dakota. And um, it is an uh, extremely aggressive plant. It has this massive, huge root system that um, is very difficult to kill. I mean, think of the, the uh, cassava we just saw. I mean, the roots aren't that big, but they're getting there and um, so you know trying to use herbicide to kill something like that is very challenging because you just burn the tops back and then the thing re-sprouts in a few months. Um, it also puts out a lot of seeds and it can fling its seeds quite some distance so it uh, both spreads by seed and uh, runners from these roots. Uh, it is uh, toxic if eaten in any quantities. Um, the people that graze cattle out west really hate it because uh, the cattle won't eat it and so if it gets in their rangeland, um, the, uh, uh, the effective acres that they have is, gets greatly reduced. And so um, there's a lot of effort uh, out uh, trying to get rid of it. Um, like I said, it can be very difficult to, um, to kill with a spray. Um, obviously, you can do it some damage with a spray, though. But additionally, people have released um, uh, several different types of beetles. I think there's four kinds of beetles and um, a mite, a spider, and a couple other things that have been released to... Uh, uh, try and just get some uh, predation going on it because of course that is the key to a lot of invasives is um, you know everything that was predatory on this and evolved with it to that would keep it in check is still back in Russia and um, uh, our native insects don't recognize it so they don't chew on it and here you can see a hawk moth uh, which is um, non-native um, the caterpillar from a hawk moth is um, uh, made quite a mess of this plant, and uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful picture of people that are battling this plant. You can see the funny little flowers, those cyanthiums. Um, it's a strange little superior ovary there, um, very unique. Uh, and so for identification, um, people sometimes mix these up with uh, some of the yellow mustards. 
Um, this is a very different flower from a mustard. It's kind of yellow-green rather than that uh, bright, bright uh, mustard yellow. And um, if you pull a leaf off, you've got uh, sticky sap, which you don't have with a mustard. Natives, um, we have some actually quite attractive uh, native uh, spurges in Iowa. This one is um, a flowering spurge that uh, has cute little white flowers and attract uh, their own special little suite of insects. Um, this is an enormously um, expanded uh, picture here. That uh, flower is probably less than half inch across. So that would be Euphorbia corallata. There's also um, uh, several species of Acalypha and Croton that grow uh, native here, along with uh, several other species of Euphorbia. And here's one of the more attractive, uh, Snow on the Mountain. This one gets sold uh, horticulturally from time to time, and it's uh, quite common in our Luff Hills. It likes those dry, um, um, well-drained soils. Toxicity, yes, there is um, uh, quite a range of, of toxins, and they depend, they vary in um, uh, uh, concentration within any given plant, depending on um, the conditions it's been grown under. Um, but in particular, the cyanogenic glucosides, um, that if you cons consume those, um, they uh, turn into hydrogen cyanide within your system, which is not good. Uh, and it uh, happens often enough that in um, Africa, there's even a disease, uh, I mean, they, they call it Konzo, um, because uh, uh, it does from time to time pop up, and especially um, in people that are, all, that are also on real low-protein diets. Um, then there's phosphorus. Phoropoids, um, which are um, uh, various different terpenes that come in many, many, many shapes, sizes, and probably colors in uh, different uh, uh, euphorbs, and um, have been tested, you know, as with so many plants like this, um, they have a lot of medical, um, uh, herbal uh, medical uses that uh, people have uh, you know, over the years um, said that well, they do this and they do that, and uh, some of them have been investigated for different things. Uh, uh, among some of the results, though, is they find that they're actually extremely inflammatory and, and pr promote tumors even um, if they don't outright kill the person. So um, probably not the best family to mess with if you're looking for dinner. A lot of links out there for this family. Um, there's an interesting, um, Amaz the Amazons had an origin myth about cassava, um, that it came from, uh, um, you know, certain uh, gifts from heaven. And uh, in uh, the island of Kemotes, or Kemotes, which is not too far from Malaysia, they have a cassava festival every year, the second weekend in June. That concludes the Euphorbiaceae.